Uh, th thanks very much. Uh, so I want to talk to you about this question, are we alone? Is anybody out there? It's a question that humans have been asking for a few hundred thousand years. And maybe in this century, we have a chance of, of answering the question. Um, the field is called SETI, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. And there have been lots of ideas over the years about how we might get in touch with ET. Some of the early ideas, Gauss, the mathematician, suggested that we get in touch with ET by making large geometric structures on the planet, a right triangle, maybe three, four, five miles on a side, a big square of dirt, a big square of water, uh, and a big square of wheat. And ET would look down and see that we knew about the Pythagorean theorem. And maybe they would get in touch. Uh, it was a great idea at the time. Unfortunately, it was not funded. Um, <laughs> And then Charles Crow suggested that we get in touch with the Martians by, no, no, I'm sorry. He suggested we get in touch with ET by digging a circular ditch um, 20 miles across and fill the ditch with kerosene and then use this match, not to scale, to make a bright, uh, a bright circle of light, a bright circle of fire. And then ET again would look down and see this bright circle uh, and maybe they would get in touch. And I, I think you might be able to guess what happened with this met with a similar fate. And then Charles Crow suggested we get in touch with the Martians by using large mirrors to reflect the sunlight to the Martians, actually several mirrors, one where he lived in Paris and the others to outline the shape of the Big Dipper. And I think you guess what happened here. Um, the first funded project in SETI was to send pornography into space. Uh, so this is a plaque. You might have seen it on the Pioneer 10 spacecraft that left the Earth in the early 70s. And uh, these are very controversial. Originally, they were holding hands. And uh, NASA decided that that was not a good idea because ET, if they found this plaque, they would think it was one creature. So they don't hold hands right now. Um, <laughs> and here's the solar system and the sun and Mercury, Venus. And here is Earth. And you can see the spacecraft leaving the Earth, traveling at about 100,000 miles an hour, going out to the stars. Uh, and then these are directions. This is a map. So that if ET uh, wants to know where we live and they want to come and eat us, they'll know exactly where we live. <laughs> so that was the first funded project. <laughs> One of the big questions in SETI is, are there good planets out there going around other stars? And if you had asked me 20 years ago, are there planets going around other stars? I would have said, I don't know. Nobody knew at that 20 years ago. But that has all changed largely due to work here at San Francisco State University. They pioneered how to find these little dinky planets. Um, planets are hard to find because they're little, they're very tiny. A million Earths could fit inside the, the sun. And they're right next to this really bright thing. So they're really hard to find. And uh, that work was pioneered here. And it led to this thing called Kepler, uh, which the way that Kepler found planets was to look and see if a planet goes in front of a star. I don't know if you see this little black dot here, but that is a planet going in front of a star. And you can't actually see the planet from the Kepler spacecraft, but what you can see is that the light dims down a little bit when the planet gets in front. The light dims down. If you see a, a star that dims down a little bit, you say, what's going on? Well, that betrays the presence of the planet. And if it goes around periodically, every few months or every year or whatever, then you really know that you found a planet. And Kepler found thousands of planets. Uh, and here's an example of some of the planets going around their stars. And you can see that a lot of the planets are in multi-planet systems, six, seven, eight planets. And now we know that there are more planets than there are stars in the Milky Way galaxy. There are about one trillion planets in our Milky Way galaxy. And if you're not happy with a trillion planets, there are about 100 billion other galaxies besides the Milky Way galaxy that we live in. A lot of places, and a lot of those planets are little dinky things like Earth, little rocky planets, and we think a lot of them have liquid water. We call them Goldilocks planets. If, this, if the planet is too far from the star, it's going to be cold. If it's, if it's too close, it's going to be too hot. If it's at the right distance, it's a Goldilocks planet. Uh, OK, you got, we have a lot of planets. Well, what about life? How often does life get started? We don't really know. We don't understand all the details, the, how the chemistry turns into self-replicating molecules. But we are optimistic about primitive life. And the reason we're optimistic is because life got started on Earth very early. The oldest rocks you can find have microfossils. As soon as the Earth cooled down, it looked like life popped up. So even though we don't understand the details, because it happened quickly here on Earth, we think it's going to happen quickly on other planets as well. Uh, 
And so there, the universe is probably teeming with simple life. We don't know how often it evolves to become intelligent and we could communicate, but it's probably teeming with simple life. There may even be life in our own solar system. So this is a moon going around Jupiter called Europa. This is a cutaway view. And you can see that it has a liquid ocean. This blue stuff is liquid water. It's heated by tidal forces. And maybe there's something swimming around down there in the ocean. The problem is we can't tell because this white stuff is ice. It's covered with ice. The, it's, even though it's warm water, it's covered with ice. It's about 30 miles thick of ice. And we don't know how to get through the ice. So when I give talks at elementary schools, I ask the kids, how are we going to get through the ice? And I tell them we don't really know. NASA doesn't know how to do it. And the, the boys have a different answer than the girls. The boys say machine guns or bombs. <laughs> They're kind of like Donald Trump. And the girls are, uh, the girls are usually a little more clever and, uh, and not as violent. They want to melt their way through the ice, like use mirrors to focus the sun's rays and heat, heat the ice. Anyway, it's interesting at elementary school already, there's a kind of separation there, unfortunately. Um, OK, so there, and there's a, a lot of other moons, and even in our own solar system, we might find primitive life. Um, what about how are we going to find intelligent life? So one of the ideas is that Earthlings are sending off a lot of radio and television out into space. And we've been transmitting television signals now for about 70 years, the early shows like I Love Lucy and Ed Sullivan have been traveling out. Now they're 70 light years out. They've gone past about 10,000 stars. And the nearby stars have seen The Simpsons. So they haven't seen Donald Trump yet. So the, this is a plot of television power leaving the Earth, 1940, 1950, 1960. And you can see we're getting brighter and brighter. And we're brighter than the sun now at television frequencies. Uh, so if we are transmitting messages that go out traveling at the speed of light much faster than our rockets, Maybe ET does that too. And we've even sent messages intentionally. Uh, this was a message transmitted in the 70s. We think that pictures are a good way to communicate. They're not going to speak English or Portuguese. But we think pictures, images might be, they're going to be able to perceive their environment or two or three dimensions. And so uh, this was a picture with a, with a person and a DNA molecule and the solar system. Maybe you can see the sun and Mercury, Venus, and the Earth tipped toward the person, a radio telescope. Anyway, that is an example of how you might Start up a conversation. Math is another good way. Prime numbers, 2 plus 2 equals 4, stuff like that. Um, OK, so we are sending off radio signals out into space. We want to find out if ET is doing that too, if they have television or radar or radio. So in order to do that, we need a big radio antenna. We call them a radio telescope. This is a, a one that we started using in the 70s. Uh, it's a 85 feet across. And while we were using this telescope to look for ET, this is what happened to it. This is the dish. It used to be up here on the pedestal. Uh, so we moved to a different telescope. Uh, we moved to this telescope. This is another radio telescope in West Virginia. This is 300 feet across, uh, one of the world's largest telescopes. And while we were using this telescope to look for radio signals from ET, this is what happened to that telescope. And you might ask, why did that happen to Dan? Why did both telescopes that he was using to look for ET get destroyed? Um, well, the answer, according to the World Weekly News, is that the aliens did not want to be discovered. And they zapped the telescope, zapped by hostile space aliens. So we're testing this idea, the zap idea, at this telescope. This is the world's largest radio telescope. It's in Puerto Rico. It's 1,000 feet across. It's called the Arecibo Telescope. It holds 10 billion bowls of cornflakes, although we haven't actually tried that yet. Um, and um, so far, it has not been zapped by hostile space aliens, uh, although it's a little harder to zap. You might have seen it in the James Bond movie, uh, GoldenEye, although in GoldenEye, they say it's in Cuba, which is not, and it comes out of the water, which it doesn't. But it, it was also in the movie Contact, which was a book written by Carl Sagan, who used to work in our group. Anyway, the, so we collect a huge amount of data at this telescope. Uh, petabytes, many petabytes of data. And the problem we have is that it's, a, it's so much data, we can't analyze it all ourselves with the computers that we have, even the supercomputer that we have at Berkeley. So we are asking volunteers all around the world to help us. If you have a computer, a laptop, or a desktop, or, or an Android phone, you can help us analyze the data. And the way it works is that we, sent, we store the data, and then we break it up into little pieces. So you, if you want to help us analyze the data, you run a little screensaver program called the SETI at Home Screensaver Program. You download this free program. If you want to find it and help us look for ET, Google SETI, S-E-T-I, and you'll find SETI at Home, and you can download this program. 
uh, and you can volunteer to help us analyze the data. And the way it works is that everybody gets a different part of the sky. So you'll get one part of the sky, you'll get a different, part of, a different piece of the data. And then when you go out for a cup of coffee, the screensaver pops up on your computer, just like a, uh, but instead of just putting pretty pictures, of goldfish swimming around on your screen. It's actually going through the data that you've been assigned, looking for all the different frequencies and signal types. And when it's done, it might take a few days, it'll send the results, whatever you find, whatever your screensaver finds, any strong signals it finds, it sends the results back to our computer at Berkeley. And your name is attached to that data. So if you find ET, you get the Nobel Prize. Although <laughs> it's actually not mine to decide, but you might get it. Um, so, um, this is a little animation of the data that's going out from Berkeley to the, all the volunteers around the world. The yellow dots are the data that we're sending out. The blue dots are when they're finished analyzing the data, uh, then they send back the results. And they form one of the biggest supercomputers on the planet. There are about 8 million people who are helping us out. They're spread out in 226 countries. And it's made the search incredibly sensitive and much more powerful beyond our wildest dreams. And we're very grateful to the SETI at Home volunteers. And I hope if you're not running SETI at Home, you'll go and download this thing and help us look for ET. Um, the software that we developed, the SETI software, uh, is open source software. And it's being now used by a lot of different science projects. So you can, at home now, instead of just doing SETI, you can look for malaria drugs and cancer drugs and HIV drugs. This is a program you can run to search for black holes. This is global warming, climate prediction. Uh, this is uh, looking at pulsars and gravitational waves. This is protein. And you can allocate how you want your computers to be used. You can say, I want 20% of my spare computing cycles to go for SETI and 30% for malaria research. Um, and, and you can participate in your favorite projects. So this is a brand new thing that we're doing this year. Um, we ran into a billionaire and the Breakthrough Prize Foundation, and they gave us a lot of money to do a huge SETI program. And we're just starting with three telescopes. In fact, one of the telescopes that we're using, we're just launching today. So we started using this thing at Lick Observatory looking for laser signals. Lick Observatory, some of you might know, is near San Jose up east on Mount Hamilton. And we're looking for laser signals there. And then we're using a telescope. The one that collapsed in West Virginia, they built a new one. And we're using this one in West Virginia. And then the, the thing that we're launching today that we're really excited about is a telescope in Australia called the Parkes Telescope. The reason we're all excited about this thing that we're starting today is that the, um, if ET's lurking in the south, these other telescopes that we've been using are in the north. So if, if it's one of the southern stars, we would have missed them. And this is very little work has been done uh, in, in Australia and looking at the southern stars. So we're really excited about that. We're going to look at a million stars and a thousand galaxies. It's a big, new, powerful project we're really excited about. Another thing that we're excited about is a brand new telescope that's being built in China. This is going to be even bigger than the one in Puerto Rico. It's 500 meters across. And you can see it's made out of little panels. And now it's all finished, and they're just starting to use it. And we're hoping to work with the Chinese to do SETI. This is a this is kind of longer term, 10 or 20 years away. We're learning how to build, instead of one big dish, build a telescope out of lots of little dishes, maybe thousands of little dishes. And this is being built in South Africa and Australia. A lot of countries are getting together. And we think that'll be a spectacular way to look for very faint signals, making a giant telescope out of lots of little telescopes. The other thing we're excited about is that computing power is getting better and better. A lot of you know about Moore's Law. And Right now, this is a plot of computing power as a function of time. And right now, computers are about as smart as a lizard or a guppy. Um, if, when, if this trend keeps going, computers will be as smart as humans in about 30 years. That's called the singularity. Watch out. Could be good. Could be bad. But in any case, we will be able to do some very good SETI experiments. Right now, we're just getting in the game. We're learning how to do it. We can't do all the frequencies and do a thorough search. But if computing power keeps going and the telescopes keep getting better, I'm optimistic in the long run. If there are radio signals out there, could be found maybe in your generation, maybe in the next generation. Um, OK, if you've been asleep, uh, this is really the only slide you have to remember. Um, no ET so far. We're still working on it. Um, however, that is not my last slide. I've got, I've got three more. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about the SETI at Home volunteers. The SETI at Home volunteers have helped us enormously. They, they built one of the biggest computers on the planet, made a very sensitive search. But they also help us write the software. It's a big open source project. They help make it go faster, port it to new platforms. They just got it working on Android. They get the bugs out. 
Um, they also send us money. The donations come from the volunteers, which is great because it keeps the students uh, working on the, analyzing the data, keeps the students fed. Then they also send in literature and music, and some send haikus. And thousands of people have sent us haikus about SETI. But don't worry, I'm not going to read you thousands of haikus. Uh, I'm just going to read you a couple of haikus. So um, the uh, Paula Cook at Duke University, searching for life, answers are revealed about ourselves. And this is the last slide, the last haiku. One million earthlings, bounded by optimism, leave their PCs on. <laughs> well, thank you very much.